Thank you very much. And first of all, what a great pleasure it is for me and an honor for LEGO Education to be able to address this group of passionate, forward-looking educators as well as innovators within educational technology. It's particularly poignant for us as we this year are celebrating 40 years of LEGO Education, 40 years of learning for and with students around the world, 40 years where we have been innovating educational technology, robotics, STEAM, and hands-on learning. 40 years that we have poured into the next member of our family of solutions for hands-on STEAM learning. And that is Spike Prime. Spike Prime that we are also showcasing here at BET this week. So I would already now encourage all of you, after the keynote, to come to the LEGO Education stand next door, not just because we are offering free coffee, but because you can get to meet Spike Prime, and Spike Prime has a huge personality. Now, of course, when you turn 40 years old, you also look a little bit back and you look forward. I can say that because even though it wasn't that recently, I remember turning 40. So you think about what you have achieved, but what is also to come. And as we turn 40 years old, we've been looking back and what, what did we think students need? How have we contributed to that? But even more so, what do the next 40 or 10 years bring? And how can we continue to contribute to the success of students in a world that is changing rapidly? And we look forward to sharing with you some of those perspectives today, seeing also to what extent education as it is today is addressing these needs and what we can do to both reimagine but actually implement these solutions in the educational system. So let's have a look at the challenge, all the opportunity as well, and the implications of a future that is shaped by technology and AI, a rapidly changing future. I'm sure a lot of these stats may not be completely new to you, but I actually think the scale of change that they are driving is significant and completely reshape the needs of how we equip students for future success. For example, based on a McKinsey study, they estimate that up to 50% of current job activities are technically automatable with even small adjustments in technology that exists today. So even without major further advancements, 50% of job activities could be impacted. That is a significant uh, shift in the distribution of job categories that we can expect. That means the future or the destination that we're shaping students for is becoming less and less clear. Not surprisingly then as well, that certain job categories, particularly those job categories of technology professionals, will grow over proportionately. As an example from the slide here, there'll be 60% growth in technology professional jobs in Germany, it's estimated. That of course both says something about the kind of jobs that we need students to have an interest in and prepare them for, but it also says something about the change and the importance of technology in their everyday. And similarly, I'm sure you'll not be surprised by the fact that predictable jobs, rules-based jobs, and not least physical jobs, will decline. Again, taking a stat from this slide, almost one-third of predictable physical work-based jobs in the US will disappear. That's a significant shift. Looking at all that, that means that not even just for students today, but for people in the workforce today, there's a need to change job categories. So between 75 and 375 million people globally will already over the next 10 years need to change jobs. And that rate of change and that rate of learning in the job is not going to go down. So the future that we're shaping the students for is one where there's an unprecedented amount, unprecedented amount of learning needed, not just in school, but even more so after they've graduated and in the job. They're going to have to reinvent themselves 
many times. And that was the main point from Yuval Harari in his Penguin speech here in London, where he talked about the automation revolution. And again, this is not a one-time event. We're not going to go from stability to change to back to stability. There's going to be a cascade of disruptions as, as, as AI improves. And that's even beyond what can be done with current technologies. And to stay relevant, humans, not just humans collectively, but us as individuals, have to be able to reinvent ourselves over and over. So this is the situation that we're educating students for. Not a given destination that we can define, but the ability to not just survive and thrive in so much change. That's why I'd like to spend a little bit of time going into, well, what is then needed? And how can we reimagine learning to truly equip students for this future? Welcome to the age of AI, an age of global transformation and mass automation, an age of deep neural networks and sentient robots where many new learners will choose careers still waiting to be conceived. And teachers everywhere will continue to reimagine the educational experience, prepping our students for what's to come. Over the next 10 years, we can expect this AI-driven transformation to accelerate, to widen across industries, categories, geographies. But the next generation of AI is being shaped now in today's classrooms, where teachers and students are building curiosity and confidence, turning fear into fun, taking advantage of their natural affinity for hands-on and play-based learning, building a foundation that lasts a lifetime. AI is shaping their world. They are shaping the future of AI. So in this future, shaped by AI technology, as well as change, what is it that we need to equip students with? Well, knowledge still remains important. It's a baseline. We need to learn language, fundamental math skills, understanding of science concepts. But it's far from enough. We have to cultivate those complementary skills, the complementary skills that are uniquely human, the complementary skills that cannot be replicated by AI and technology, but the complementary skills that will allow us to get value out of that and leverage technology and AI for good. It's about complex problem solving. It's about critical thinking. In a time where you can't always be sure that the information you get is correct, you need to be able to think critically about it, assess whether you believe in it. Even in an age of AI, increased technology, giving away your own data, you also have to think critically, also about the ethical implications. We have to cultivate creativity and collaboration and the emotional intelligence connected with that. It is in the collaboration between humans that we will create value and thrive, and not least resilience. Resilience, because we have to be able to cope with the change, because we won't get it right the first time, every time. And that's maybe then the most important thing as we see it and the next frontier for education. So from knowledge to skills to confidence, the confidence to be lifelong learners, to adopt a growth mindset, one where you're not hankering for the next level of stability, but where you will face challenges and opportunities, where you believe that through a focused effort and application, you will ultimately succeed. So it's not about the confidence in knowing exactly where you're going. It's the confidence to believe that you're equipped for that journey. Now, when we then look at that, are we then giving students that ultimate confidence? Harris Poll last year conducted a piece of research around confidence, particularly in STEAM learning and in middle school. They conducted it over six different countries and among both parents, teachers, and students. It was conducted in the US, here in the UK, in Germany, in Russia, in China, and in Japan. And the findings were pretty similar across. 
And worryingly, one of the key findings was that 47% of students say that they avoid subjects where they failed once before. So when we fail, we don't get back to it, we hold it out. And when we do that, for sure we're not going to learn from that failure. It's going to become a meaningless failure, not a meaningful failure. And in a future where we cannot expect everyone to have the answer, we have to be ready to fail and learn from that. Maybe even more worryingly, 51% of students said that trying new things at school makes them nervous. Ultimately, again, probably the fear of failure. What is the right answer? Can I actually do it? And they're graduating into a world where the only thing that's going to be certain is actually change. Then, we know particularly the area of STEAM and STEM are important. We, we saw how jobs are going to grow in that area. We know they're going to play a role across most of jobs. Only one-fifth of students actually felt very confident in, in STEAM subjects. And if they're not very confident, they're a lot less likely to engage and seek careers in that area. That is, of course, a challenge, but maybe it's also part of the key to where the solution might be. Because what the research also found was that students who were confident in STEAM, subjects where, again, they're faced with challenges and they work their way through and they iterate, etc., were much more than twice as likely to be confident in school today. So as an example here, 82% of students who felt confident in STEAM were confident in school today. Only 33% were confident in school today if they were not confident in STEAM. So if we can build confidence in STEAM, we can both build the knowledge and the desire and interest in STEAM. We can also build some of those complementary skills, but we can also build con uh, fundamental confidence and the core of that growth mindset. And how do we then build that confidence in STEAM? No surprise, it starts with hands-on learning. No surprise, hopefully, and I think some of you may have uh, are aware of this uh, quote or Chinese proverb around, tell me and I'll forget, show me and I'll remember, but engage me and let me try and I'll truly understand. And that, of course, works extremely well generally, but also in STEAM. And 95% of educators believed it was the number one way to do it. And there was unanimity across parents, teachers, and students that hands-on learning in STEAM builds confidence, it helps retain information, and it helps understand complex concepts. So hands-on learning is a key to build confidence in STEAM, to build confidence for life, to build lifelong learners particularly when we then combine hands-on learning with the power of learning through play. A methodology that builds on hands-on, but builds a number of those core complementary skills that I spoke about before. Because when you look at what are the core attributes of play, they link extremely well to learning. It's about being actively engaged. Because learners that are actively engaged demonstrate motivation and commitment. It's about being joyful. When it's joyful, you enjoy it, it, it and it makes you more confident. It's about meaningful. I'm not learning this just because I'm being told to, because the teacher says I need it, but because it's meaningful to me, maybe I'm engaging in a project to find a solution to something that I think is important. And when something is meaningful, it further drives sustained engagement deeper learning and retention of information. And all this is based on foundational research from the Lego Foundation. Socially interactive. When we collaborate, when we have to communicate with each other, when we have to negotiate, when we have to align, we build fundamental social skills and the ability to communicate. And not least when it's iterative and play is iterative. As you know, Lego play is iterative. You build something, you look at it, maybe it falls apart, then you try again, you realize you should have done something different. Maybe it works, but you can become even more ambitious. That iteration and that trial and error encourages exploration and it builds resilience. Because you know the failures that you have along the way build towards ultimate success. 
And again, we know from that research that learning based on the principles of learning through play makes students retain knowledge better, it builds curiosity and creativity, and in a world of change, curiosity is extremely valuable, and particularly in STEAM, engaged hands-on learning perform better. So if we combine hands-on learning with the basics of learning through play in the area of STEAM, we will equip students with key knowledge, with the key complementary skills that we need that are uniquely human, that will not be replaced by AI. And lastly, we build confidence and we build that growth mindset. So there's a strong connection here, a focus on STEAM learning, a focus on building key skills and confidence through hands-on learning through play. This is a core to reimagining learning. And if we can bring these components into classrooms, we will start equipping students for a future of change. We will build the habits and the mindsets at an early age that they will need in that future where they have to reinvent themselves and reinvent themselves. They will go out as employees, not trying to do as few things wrong as possible. They'll try to do as many things right as possible. Because if you go out and try to do as few things wrong as possible, you have a fixed mindset. You say, what are the rules? Who has the answer for me? And you focus on not making the mistake. And you can go through life not making mistakes yet not doing anything right. They have to go out and try to do as many things right as possible. That's what's going to move them forward, that's going to make them learn, and it's going to make the, com the companies they're in learn. And first and foremost, it will make them embrace change rather than try to hide from change. So for us, a key element of reimagining learning is about bringing the, the properties of learning through play to education from K to 12 because we believe it is a true path forward for fostering those key complementary life skills, the key complementary uniquely human life skills, but also a mindset for lifelong learning. Their ability to thrive, their ability to succeed is dependent upon this. Now there are some misconceptions around learning through play and you might be asking yourself the question, but learning through play that sounds a lot like play. Isn't that just for the younger students? Important to say, and hopefully you can also see, that the principle, of, of course, apply across age groups. And there's actually a lot, and again, the LEGO Foundation has proven this, lots of uh, pedagogies out there, such as uh, uh, problem-based uh, learning, uh, inquiry-based uh, learning, as an example, experiential learning, collaborative learning, they build on a lot of the concepts that are key to learning through play. And it is shown that they are effective because they engage, because they promote interaction, because they are meaningful and they're joyful and they're socially interactive. So the principle can be applied just as well in high school, in engineering as an example, as well as in preschool. And the more we can build on this, the more we will build those habits that students need and will ensure their success. The second misconception can be that it's just open-ended. Is there a room for the teacher? Is there any intentionality in what the students actually learn? And yes, there is. Learning through play has elements both of uh, teacher-guided, teacher-directed, but also child-directed when we get to the open-ended part of it. But there is, because there is guided practice. But the, role of the teacher obviously changes through that process. More from directing to actually facilitating the learning. But in this open-ended part is also where a lot of the power comes. Because when we get to the open-ended project part of it, you also get much more differentiated and personalized learning. It's a bit like building with your Lego bricks. If you're a master, you'll build the Taj Mahal. If you've just started, you'll build a spaceship that looks like a swimming pool. But you are stretching yourself and you'll take another iteration and another iteration. So it allows the students to stretch themselves just beyond where their abilities currently are. That's when they'll be in flow, but that's also where they learn. 
if you only focus within what you know you can achieve, you're not going to learn anything. So again, there is an incredibly important role for the teacher in this as well. So no surprise, when we talk about reimagining learning, we believe that learning through play should be a central part in this because it offers many benefits, not least student confidence and building lifelong learners. And again, that's what they need for success first and foremost. Again, the notion that we can send students to college or to university, believe that they'll get all the knowledge that they'll ever need and that that will keep them successful for the rest of their lives is not right. If you want to be a lifelong learner anywhere, sorry, a lifelong employee anywhere, you have to be ready to be a lifelong learner. And you can only be a lifelong learner if you are open to and embracing change. All right, so we know a lot of change is happening. We know we need to equip students for that. And we, need, we know we need to do a better job of that. And hands-on, learning through play, not least in the area of STEAM, is important here. But then how do we actually make it happen? How do we make it happen within the confines of education and the classroom today? To help us answer that question, I'm happy to invite on to the stage Lord Jim Knight, Chief Executive and External Officer at TESS Global, and also with a long career of focusing uh, on child education, um, uh, both as a practitioner but also a policymaker. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, great to be here, Esben. Thank you. Yeah. So we have a few questions for you and where you can share from, from your experience uh, here. So my first question is, again, from your vantage point, can you share uh, your view on the importance of building uh, competencies in STEAM and STEM, the softer skills as well, but ultimately building student confidence and why this is important, maybe particularly why it's important also in the UK? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we have a particular problem here in the UK where we've been We've known for a long time that science and maths are really important for future careers, they're really important academic subjects for learning. But we've become infatuated by the pure academic of science and maths. And we talk about STEM, and it's just become S and M. We've dropped the application of the academic into uh, technology and engineering. So we've missed that out of STEM by and large with things like the uh, the erosion of design and technology in the curriculum. And we need to bring those back um, because they are bringing in the A of STEAM, they're bringing in the creative, and they're also bringing in those soft skills that you talk about, and they're, br they're bringing in resilience, they're bringing in collaborative learning, they're bringing in um, complex uh, problem solving that are all absolutely key for future success uh, in the labor market, future success indeed in education. I was talking to the president of the Royal Society last year, and Savenki is a Nobel Prize winning scientist. And he says for more Nobel Prize winners, he needs multidisciplinary uh, thinkers across science. He doesn't need them narrowly siloed because he needs creativity. So these are really important for our future economy, for the future of our learners. Fantastic. Maybe you can also share whether you believe that the school system is also building the confidence that I guess he needs the people that he works to come in and work in a multidisciplinary fashion. So are we building the confidence with students in the way that we approach uh, education as an example, testing, etc.? Yeah, I'm struggling to hear what you said. That's all right, that's all right. <laughs> um, because of the, the, the sound system, but yeah. uh, say that again. It was more about whether the, the you see beyond the building of the broader set of skills, yeah. whether we're also building that uh, confidence and that uh, mindset of yeah. lifelong learning. So I, I, one of the, th the pieces of evidence I would give you is, um, many of you will have heard of the PISA study carried out by OECD that, and the results were announced last month for the, the latest set of sampling. The UK came bottom in respect of our learners here in the UK and their fear of failure. We've done something in the way we educate our kids that they are terrified of failure. And yet, as you've said, Esben, in the workplace, we need people who 
will learn, they will fail, they will learn from that failure, they will maybe fail again, but then they will succeed. That's how you do things right, as opposed to not doing things wrong. And it's only when we have everyone doing more things right that we create value and we build. Great. Thank you. Then how do we make it happen? So what can we do? How can we bring a playful environment? How can we build that broader set uh, of skills? Uh, of course, I think there's an opportunity for more systemic uh, change, but what are some of the steps that we can do in classrooms and schools already today to start building both the skills and the confidence? Yeah, I mean, we do need to start getting on with this rather than waiting for policymakers like I was 10 years ago when I was minister to sort of catch up and smell the coffee. And that, I think, is about where we can, finding time within the curriculum for subjects like uh, design and technology. Um, I think it's um, in, in turn about celebrating some of the great teaching there's always been with different sorts of pedagogies, not just instructional, not just you guys sat in rows listening attentively to every word, but getting your hands dirty, getting stuck in, applying some of that learning, learning in groups, all pedagogies that we're familiar with, but have become slightly less fashionable because of the way Ofsted works or the way the accountability works. We need to find room for that. And finally, I would say, you know, I, I chair a, a network called Whole, Whole Education, which is about um, educating the whole child, not just the exam passing child. And one of the things we see are examples around the country of head teachers who are looking for where the rules don't apply. There's a lot more freedom in Key Stage 3. There's a lot more freedom out of hours than there is in hours, where you're, you know, you're basically unregulated. We should use those freedoms more creatively to do some of these things so that we are making learning more engaging for our young people and giving them the skills they need for the future. Great. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. And we agree, we believe there are lots of opportunities to start on that journey. Not to necessarily wait for systemic change and to go through a few of these. Incorporate joyful hands-on learning. When kids get something in their hands, when they create something, they understand it better, they retain information better, and it's more meaningful to them. That can be done without upending the school day. Make coding, STEAM, and uh, robotics, as an example, interesting, fun, and engaging by also making it problem-based. It's, it's much more interesting to learn a code if you're solving a problem. And by the way, in the process, then you learn computational thinking, problem-solving, versus just the code as a piece of knowledge. Make it collaborative, making it socially interactive. Again, you build those key social um, and emotional skills but you actually also build the understanding that there's solution diversity. You see what others make, there's not just one answer, there's many answers. And that is the first step also towards resilience. That we can further strengthen by making learning iterative, by celebrating the process of trial and error, and to see failure as a step towards success, because then we embrace it, then we learn from it, and we build resilience and confidence out of that. And then we will enable students' success for their life by making them confident, lifelong learners. Not by chasing a technology or a particular technology destination, but by equipping them with the skills to navigate a world where things change. And if we do that, then will education will live up to one of the eight things that Forbes identified that are essential in the fourth industrial revolution. We need to develop the skill set, the complementary skills, and the mindset to do anything in their future, not a particular something. Confidence in learning isn't built overnight. It happens every day. Wherever there are problems to solve, and hands to help solve them. Fueling curiosity and creativity, lifelong learning, and lasting life skills. Confidence is sparked and nurtured in every classroom where STEAM learning happens, and students learn together. Growing day after day after day with the help of amazing teachers and the hands-on learning tools of LEGO Education.
Learning starts with confidence. Confidence in learning starts with Lego education. I got it. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, by the way, I think I, I mentioned that Chinese proverb. So I've shown you, so, uh, I've told you something. You may f well forget it. I've shown you something. Hopefully you remember that. I saw a few iPhones up. But if you really want to understand it, you have to get your hands on. The Lego Education Stand is just next door. And I invite all of you to come over and visit us, see about building confidence, and not least uh, to meet Spike Prime. Thank you very much. <laughs>